It's now time to welcome our final panel of the day to the stage. We have our moderator is Mr. Uh, Dr. Amir Zarakesh. And first, also, let's give him a big round of applause. So much of what you've seen today is because of Amir's incredible work. It is not easy keeping the trains running on time, getting everyone here. So thank you, Amir John. And I welcome you to the stage to welcome your panel. And everyone on panel three, if you'll join us on the stage now, I believe you know who you are. You're missing one of our panelists. I think Tony Perkins is outside. If you can ask him to come in. He was taking up something outside. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I know everybody has is, is had a very long day. It has been, at points, very hot, hopefully for the subject, not only for the air here. <laughs> and uh, you have seen this many times. It's kind of it's getting a little bit maybe uh, too standard, the way we have gone. So the subject actually asked us to have a little bit different, maybe have it a little bit less formal for the last panel of the day. And I just want to say that one of the things that we have seen actually throughout the day, maybe you have got this cue many times, uh, that uh, the, one of the most interesting part and aspect of making the entrepreneurship and make it happen is the unpredictability and the part which actually uh, nobody knows exactly how to make it. We may all you know, act like you know, we know how to do it. I have been blessed by friends that they have done this many times. And believe it, I have seen that even after sometimes doing it, sometimes it doesn't happen. And maybe that's the part that makes it the most interesting part of all this. There is a science to it, but to a limit. And that's where it gets to the point that you cannot teach entrepreneurship. The only way to do it is really by mentors and coaching, because it gets to a point that's not predictable. So let's, let's have our also panel to kind of be uh, a little bit more interactive and, and consider this aspect be a little bit less formal and, and hopefully we get all of you out of the room sooner than, 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 than even the plan was before. So uh, we'll start here. I'll uh, make an introduction for, for, for the panel. They, they provide you with a short presentation and then we'll have some QA. So let me, let me start with, with Daniel Epstein. Uh, he has been uh, blessed by doing entrepreneurship very early in age. By the time that he got out of the undergraduate, he actually had three companies already been made. In 2012, uh, uh, the Inc. magazine put him three under 30 entrepreneurs list. And uh, by Forbes, top 30 most in impactful entrepreneurs of the year. In uh, 2013, he received the prestigious Entrepreneur of the Award Award. So I think he's done with all the awards he gets. It's time to give back. And then today is the day that he's going to do that. Can you come here? Thank you. Slides. The scan, Gaston? Perfect. OK, so I guess we, we will do this a little bit differently. I'll start by not talking about the organization I founded, the Unreasonable Institute, and instead tell you about a completely different organization called the Highlander Institute, which is what this is. Uh, the Highlander Institute existed in the 1950s and 1960s in the southern part of the United States, and its stated mission was to combat the greatest social challenges of its time. 
It's the 1950s, 1960s in the United States. In the South, the greatest social challenges that it identified was racial inequity and racism. Uh, what is amazing about the Highlander Institute, and nobody knows this story, but both Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King went to this institution for three months before they went out on their first campaigns for social action. So if I were to describe to you what we're trying to do at the Unreasonable Institute, it's to become the Highlander Institute for the 21st century. But we have a couple beliefs that shape how we go about this that are different than Highlander. The first one is that the issues we face are no longer regional or national. That's why we're having this conversation today, because the issues we face are transnational. They transcend borders. The second difference in belief that we have is that although social action is important, the greatest and most powerful tool that we have in our tool belt is entrepreneurship. It's business, it's investment. So with that, what we do at the Unreasonable Institute is we are a mentorship-driven program, and I'll get into that, that brings together about 25 entrepreneurs every year, typically from about 20 countries, and puts them all in the same house under the same roof for six weeks. Our goal is to align these entrepreneurs with what we would call an unfair advantage, so they can scale further, farther, faster. An unfair advantage to us is some specific skill training, uh, it is mentorship, is the cornerstone of our model. It's access to investment, and it's this global network of, of support. Um, we have run now five unreasonable institutes. We've worked with just shy of 100 companies and operations about 40 countries. Uh, what's been amazing about this model is that something, something seems to be working. Uh, the average company that graduates from our programs, they have a 2.7x increase in revenue within 12 months, a 2.5x increase in team size, within 12 months, uh, and we give all the credit of that to the entrepreneurs and to the mentors themselves. Um, so one, one thing that we really believe, as you can see from this map, is we bring everybody together and we put them in the same spot. We don't do digital mentorship. Uh, we think that you need to break bread with somebody. You want to brush your teeth next to that person. Uh, and so for us, with our mentors, we'll fly them out to Colorado with our entrepreneurs from all around the world. We'll pick them up and drop them off at the airport. We'll bring them into the house. We have a chef that cooks all the meals. So part of that is we, we pride ourselves on hospitality. That's how we get amazing mentors. But the other side is if I pick you up and drop you off at the airport, then you don't have a car. So you can't drive anywhere once you arrive at the Unreasonable Institute. If we cook all of your meals and if we house you, then you have no reason to ever leave the house. And this is really important because we want you hanging out with our mentors, not when you give a talk for five minutes after that, and not just when you share a meal, we want you there at three in the morning brainstorming in front of a whiteboard. We want you brushing your teeth next to that entrepreneur at 7 a.m. We want you playing volleyball with them at noon. And that's where we think real relationships are forged. It's not networking, it's not professional, it's messy, it's human, it's a hell of a lot more fun than that. Um, so that's how we go about it. We call it the island effect, um, uh, is our theory of innovation. Uh, now we took this a little bit far last year in terms of this belief in the island effect and trapping good mentors and entrepreneurs together. We launched a program called Unreasonable at Sea, and we figured the best thing to an island, instead of an island, is a ship. It's literally a floating island. Now, what's beautiful about that is you can sail around the world. So one of our mentors, Kamran Alahian, uh, who graciously invited me here today, he, he was with us on that ship for about a month. Um, we had the Archbishop Desmond Tutu with us as a mentor for 11 weeks. We had the founder of WordPress come out for a week, the founder of Priceline for a month, and we had 11 technology entrepreneurs experimenting on how do you scale into new international waters, not waters, countries. Uh, and how we did that in terms of our route um, was pretty unconventional as well. Uh, we sailed 44,000 nautical kilometers over four months, went into 14 countries. This was the route we took, you know, US over to Japan, China, Vietnam, Singapore, uh, Myanmar, India, uh, through Mauritius down to South Africa, Ghana, Barcelona, um, oh, Morocco, Barcelona. Uh, it was an incredible experiment in the power of mentorship. And I want you just to imagine for a second, you have Carmen Alahan, you have the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, you have the founder of WordPress, you have the founder of Expedia, and you're all trapped together on a ship. If you're an entrepreneur, think about how incredible that experience would be. Um, and this gets down to the power of mentorship for us, which is confine people in close quarters, Right? break some of the rules, have them live together, and create real bonds. Um, this is a shot of us on the ship. You can see it really is an island. You can't go anywhere. Um, and so we got really close. A lot of partnerships um, were, were forged there that I don't think would ever normally have been forged. Now, I'll just close with the last thought. This is a core value at a reasonable. It is that we is greater 
than I. Um, I like to make fun of myself and, and our team. Uh, and I say this somewhat seriously when I say that those who can't do teach and those who can't do or teach run accelerators. Uh, our job <laughs> is to convene, right? It's create the conditions for mentorship to really flourish. And the only piece of advice I'd give entrepreneurs who are tuning in from Iran or entrepreneurs in this audience is uh, some words from Bill Cosby, who and he was asked, what makes you successful? He said, I don't know the key to success, but I know the key to failure, and it's trying to please everyone. And so why I say that is choose your mentors carefully, because the people you want to listen to are those who have achieved the level of scale you want to achieve in the way that you want to achieve it. Everybody will give you advice if you ask for it. Do not listen to everybody. Listen to those few people who you really aspire to become yourself. So thank you so much. I look forward to answering more questions. Thank you, Dan. So the next uh, panelist uh, actually is a very good example of the effort that has gone to, to make here uh, in this event happen. We, we had about 20 guests that we invited uh, from Iran. About 10 of them were speakers, and uh, it took a lot for, for them to, to be able to come here. There are visa issues. They have to wait in a line to, to make it happen. We really want to thank from everybody that is here for all they've gone through to be here in this meeting, some of them maybe even for, for a couple of days, two or three days, uh, to be able to share their, their, their experiences with you. We really appreciate that. Some of them, as you heard earlier, there were some problem happened. They had to even go back even sooner than the three days or four days they were planning to be here. They, they went back in the second day. So one of the examples here that we have is uh, Dr. Ali uh, Fotovat, uh, and he is a uh, professor at uh, uh, Sanati uh, Sharif University uh, in Iran. Uh, he couldn't be with us. Uh, but we have him uh, through the video that he has sent us to us. We really appreciate that. And in his background is one of the examples of uh, uh, the uh, brain drain that we just mentioned earlier. This is more like in the brain circulation case. He's a, a Caltech and a Stanford graduate that has worked in Philips for many years here, has been pioneer of technology in US. He went back, become a prof, a very influential one in addition to have many of the students that he brought to the industry back there, he actually founded and started many of the uh, companies that came out in the, in the alley, which is back in, in, in uh, Sharif University, and many of you may know that it, it, it has been a hotbed for startups. So we'll hear from what he has sent to us. Thank you. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, mentoring and uh, what I think about it when it comes to uh, entrepreneurship possibilities uh, coming out of Iran. Uh, as a start, I have a picture of our faculty, uh, three of my colleagues in our advanced IC design lab with our PhD and MS students. The pillars of our culture and the core principles that we mentor our students come from the doctrine of Zoroaster, uh, pure thinking, pure talk, and pure action, which date back to 2,600 years ago. From the Islamic period, we have uh, hundreds of poets and writers who are all unified in their ideas of humanism and moderation. And I have some examples of uh, how uh, moral and ethical issues uh, show up in our literature uh, in the last 1,000 years. Uh, in the next slide, I have examples from Ferdowsi from 1,000 year ago, years ago and Moulavi uh, 800 years ago and uh, Saadi Hafez and I end up with Suhab Setehri who is one of our contemporary poets. And I let you look at these later and uh, in view of time. The academic strength of Iran comes from a highly educated population. Our university system is pretty much organized like the American setup. Uh, in the last 20 years, we have started a, a PhD program and uh, we have started PhD programs in all of our universities and we are a, 
uh, I think, a good contributor to international technologies. Fortunately, the political disruptions of the past 30 years have not had, had much effect on the academic side. What is attractive for us when it comes to US is that I firmly believe that US continues to be the mecca of science, technology, and entrepreneurial innovation. Americans have been the main contributor to academic openness and structured thinking, and this is a sole uh, position that they enjoy throughout human history. What I think is uh, that US and Iran are both losing is that if I send my student to Europe, uh, when they study there, they have the opportunity to return home and make contributions to both countries. Examples of this are uh, Mubarak Steel and Daniele of Italy, or Iran Khodro, which is our major automotive uh, car manufacturer, automotive manufacturer, and Peugeot of France. And there's many examples in the private sector. On the other hand, an Iranian graduating from US, uh, it has been proven that 89% end up uh, staying there. Uh, and we are fortunate that there are many founders of huge IT enterprises and NASA directors. And uh, I can talk about myself uh, that in the top 20 universities, there are professors who have been uh, my students and they're uh, key contributors. In the next slide, I have some interesting figures. When you think about them, you understand that the real Iran that we are in today is different from what uh, people hear about. I have compared the uh, number of faculty, uh, BS, MS, and PhD students at Stanford University Electrical Engineering Department and Sharif University. And what's interesting is that these percentages are the percentage of female uh, faculty and students. And you can see on the PhD side, our numbers are even higher. When I returned home 23 years ago, uh, I decided to focus on training Silicon Valley quality engineers. Uh, this is what I taught in my classes and also in my consulting projects. Uh, I had a strong feeling that uh, an academic link uh, requires 20 years to be established. And therefore, this link, I thought, should not have been disrupted. I think it would be very interesting to look at the contributions of these hundreds and thousands of students who have uh, come to US after the Islamic Revolution and uh, really find out how much uh, contribution has been to American industry and academia and how much more could have existed uh, if our relationship would uh, become more normalized. In return, uh, in return, after all these contributions, uh, my graduate students cannot access IEEE papers with one click. This is something that happened in the, that has happened in the last two or three years and is a nuisance, to say the least. If I want to make uh, ICs, chips, uh, to test our ideas, uh, we cannot do it openly. We have to go through covers. Uh, that means through other universities, uh, through other means. Finally, I end up by saying that I have a dream that one day our students can go to US uh, for internships, which means undergrads during summer. I have a dream that uh, we can use the Moses program or other silicon fabrication facilities like any other university in the world. I have a dream that my students can help both Iran and US as professionals. And I have a dream that US and Iran could see the brighter side of each other. And what's funny is that my dreams are so easily attainable. I end up my discussion with a poem from Sohrab Sepehri, 
who is a contemporary uh, poet of Iran, uh, with his last sentence, water is only a step away, let us taste the light. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We are going to move now to the uh, next panelist. Uh, again, uh, this panelist, Mohsen Maloyeri, also is not with us right now. Again, due to the uh, visa not being on time, it's, it's only like by probably a couple of days didn't make it. Um, and uh, in, in his case, is actually is a very uh, important example of the efforts that's happening right now in Iran in the infrastructure ecosystem around the startups. They're gathering, uh, and uh, the very uh, strong trend that has happened past couple of years uh, for the young, uh, educated population there that would like to do uh, and get together on the startups. The, one of the videos you saw earlier, which you saw in many different cities, uh, the entrepreneur getting together is actually the result of the work that Mosa Maloyeri and his companies have done. And he, is both on the, he has done work both on the investment on the companies and also uh, making many of the entrepreneurship gatherings uh, in Iran. We have, again, a message from him that we'd like to hear right now. Hello, everyone. Uh, I apologize for not being able to make it there. But believe me, my heart is there with you, and I, I really wish I had the chance to meet every one of you in person. I have to thank the organizing committee for you know, putting up this amazing event, which I believe is going to play an important role to create that bridge uh, which can connect entrepreneurs, Iranian entrepreneurs around the world with the ones, with the ones back in, in, in Iran. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, the last two years and what has happened uh, to Iranian startup ecosystem. Uh, when we look at the startup ecosystem two years ago in Iran, there was uh, basically not, nothing much about the startups. Even the startup world was not something that being adopted by people uh, in the country. Two years ago, the first startup weekend event in September, uh, I'm not sure which day was this, but in September, uh, two years ago, the first startup weekend event uh, was organized in, in Iran, where more than 120 people showed up in that event. Uh, the, I myself, I was among the organizing team at that moment, but we, the, the result was really impressive and it suddenly became a huge movement in the country. Only in the past two years, there were uh, 25 Startup Weekend events in more than nine cities and other events like Lean Startup Machine, um, Startup Grinds, all these are, Failcon, are these, they are all happening in the country at this moment. You know, Startup Weekly and Monthly meetups are happening. On the other hand, you see that venture capitals are now stepping into the market. You know, there are local venture capitals being shaped by local funds. Uh, so all these changes on the ecosystem on one hand, and on the other hand, you see that uh, startup you know, success stories are being shaped. You know, startups such as DigiColor, Cafe Bazaar, Tahfi Fund, Apparat, A Network, these startups which are being funded by young entrepreneurs, uh, is uh, really they are growing so fast and they are uh, becoming the success stories of the country and, this, and definitely success breeds success. What is so interesting that happened uh, in, the, in the past couple of months is, uh, you know, startup accelerators are now being shaped in the country. Avatech Accelerator, which I'm a co-founder myself, is uh, uh, a startup accelerator in the country. is a six-month acceleration program in the country providing startups with seed funding. Uh, we provide startups with $8,000 and a lot of trainings, mentorship, and office space. We're not the only startup accelerator. Demon Accelerator, which is a brand of plugins places, started as an accelerator in the country. And other accelerators like MAPS, and these are happening in Iran. You know, uh, they are supporting the entrepreneurship movement in the country. All these incidents are affecting the way startups are being shaped in the country. But one thing is missing here. That can really work as a catalyzer to the growth of a startup ecosystem in the country, and that is basically mentorship. You know, although the first generation of successful entrepreneurs in you know technology field and especially in internet and mobiles are now being shaped, 
but there is a lot of things need to be done on mentorship side. We really need your help on this, on this part and I wish I was there to talk to every one of you in person and ask you for this. So you can make a difference. You know, you can help Iranian entrepreneurs uh, either by Skype calls or you know, while you are in town, you can give a, give a visit to accelerator programs or even these events which are happening. Uh, we are really looking forward to have your you know, support to our own ecosystem. Uh, I'm going to provide my contact information as a slide at the end of the, this video. So just send us an email and tell us how you can help and how you can support this movement. And we would be more than happy to put you in touch with you know, even organizers or even startup founders. Thank you so much and hope to see you in the next Bridge 2015. Goodbye. So the next panelist we have is Farshad Noshadi, and then the interesting thing about his uh, background and experience is he actually, his life is a kind of bridge because he's playing the both roles, uh, both inside Iran and also outside. He's one of the uh, level 29 mentors in London, and at the same time, he's the VP of strategy at Salmon Bank. Uh, Salmon Bank is one of the largest banks in Iran, uh, definitely the most advanced bank in the, in the sense of technology, and, and and uh, Farshad had a significant role in, in making that happen. So, Farshad, please. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And it's a real privilege to be here. Um, I just want to say that I'm probably very much like you guys. I was uh, born in Iran, but as a child of the age of eight, I uh, left Iran and I was brought up for 45 years in the UK. And uh, I was uh, basically for 25 years, I was a uh, global consultant for uh, Reuters Financial Services and I worked for Microsoft. And 10 years ago, I had this opportunity to try to take up some of my ideas and to try to maybe help Iran. My father always said, wherever you can, go and help Iran. And it was a privilege. So in these 10 years, every other month, I've been going back to Iran and very much working together with the Salmon Bank and some startups and innovations that have been taking place. My, my talk is very much a passionate talk. It's about what I've been seeing in the last few years in Iran is just does my head in. It, it's exploded, the technology. I'm moving forward. Uh, let's just go forward here. This is forward. There we go. Okay. Um, first thing I, I just noticed is the explosion of mobile phones. Uh, I was there just last week. As I say, I go so regularly. And I see nowadays even beggars with, with Android phones. In fact, there's one guy asked me for, for 100 torments or 200 torments. I said, look, I'm not involved in this. I give to charity, to my own charity. And then he asked me, what's your favorite app? And you know, this guy is asking me what my Android favorite app is. I'm just amazed at, at the growth of this technology. And everywhere you go, there is everybody, just like on the metros, on the buses, walking around. I mean, one of the things is the commercials say, please don't use your smartphone while you're driving or smoking. You know, it's just amazing. Uh, the amount of technologies used everywhere. Um, I do a lot of talks in, in, in the Gulf, in Dubai, and in some Arabic countries uh, and about innovation and technology in Iran that I've seen. And a lot of uh, my, my, my colleagues in, in, in Saudi Arabia and in the UAE are astonished to actually realize how much technology has grown in the last few years. Iran, uh, as I said, has got the largest... Uh, mobile handset population in, in the Middle East, uh, about uh, 120 million handsets. And recently, which is a pretty exciting, the, the, the smartphone, because people in Iran are very, very price sensitive, generally speaking. Uh, okay, I need to move. Uh, and now they're coming around 200,000, 150,000 torments. So that means now everybody can now get a smartphone. I feel right now in Iran, we're at a really pivotal point here. It's a tremendous time for, for investment. Um, moving forward. Uh, let's move you forward. There we go. And recently, as of last week or so, now uh, hands-free uh, 3G and 4G is now av available to almost everybody. Before Rytel, one of the small networks had a monopoly on, on, on 3G. Now 4G and 3G is now available to the whole of the population. And, it, and I think that this is once again pivotal. So things like Uber technology, which is like always on, Hundreds of other technologies will now become available, which was not there before. Um, and, okay, moving forward. Um, I see, I was just 
uh, last week, as I said, in Tehran. I just, something that I'm just so amazed. This is homegrown technology. Due to sanctions, you see a lot of technologies that maybe in, 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 in the Saudi Arabia or the UAE, they can just buy technology from the West. In Iran, it's homegrown. These are highly intelligent people. We develop it ourselves. And I'm now seeing, for example, the, one of the most sophisticated integrated transportation, which I'm proud to say, in, in, in Tehran right now. You buy these electronic tickets, it's all NFC-based technology, uh, and it's now you can then use one NFC to get into all the metros, to get on all the buses, and the parking. One universal integrated card, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Just show you of what technology is becoming available moving forward. Um, some of the latest figures I've seen in, in Iran right now. Did you know that we have 33,000 ATMs? Four or five years ago, we had hardly anything. Uh, now, um, we can now got debit cards, 280 million debit cards, which uh, someone bank has got a significant part of that uh, market, which I'm very proud of. Uh, that means for every Iranian today, they have three debit cards uh, out there, which is, which is quite, quite amazing. 2.1 million POS terminals. I think if you take all the other uh, Middle Eastern countries, you still won't reach this, this, this level. Um, okay, move, moving forward. Uh, I'd just like to show, show you in the last... Uh, about 10 years, I've, we've worked tremendously, and I've tried to influence the board by putting the latest technology innovation in, in my bank, which is the Someone Bank. We were one of the first people to bring internet, internet banking. We were one of the first banks. I remember telling the board four years ago, we need to invest in this thing called the Android apps. We need to bring out the iOS apps, and we were one of the first people to bring it out. Now it's almost used everywhere. Uh, also, we were innovative in bringing some of the latest approaches to bank. In fact, if you could show this video, I'd be very grateful. Um, let's go for it. This is some of our new branches. We have over 350 branches. Oh, sorry, 250 branches. I don't know what's happened to the sound. To sound. Okay. Um, we try to create now. I think this is as good as anything you get at the Bank of America or Citigroup or Manhattan. A really nice, clean, we will welcome you, give you a cup of tea. Khosha Amadi to Banki Sama, we're working together with you. We direct people to internet services, provide one-to-one -one connection. So there should be a lovely sound in the background, this happy, happy guy. Uh, we also got VIP services. Um, and, uh, oh, great. Banki Sama. I'm really proud that we have innovated, and a lot of other banks are copied. Oh, yeah, no, no, we can do it, as good as anyone. I, I particularly like, which I feel fantastic, in every new bank or something, we have a children-friendly area, so your kids can come play while you can do your online transactions or advice properly. Also, online payment is exploded now. You can actually put your bill payments directly onto our laser ATMs, and it will also pay you online or through the mobile services. Okay, um... So let me just, just quickly finish uh, why I feel what I've seen in, in the last uh, five, six years in Iran is an amazing opportunity for, for investment. Hopefully when sanctions are removed, I think Iran is, is like the perfect storm, the perfect environment for investment. Let me just quickly go through. Iran, as we talked about, 20th largest economy in the world, highly educated, highly motivated, people who majority of them love Western culture, Particularly, um, I have a lot of friends, relations, uh, individuals living in the West. Innovation and financing is really exploding right now. Uh, nowadays, you're getting Iranians who say, I hardly need to go to the bank anymore, which is absolutely fantastic to hear that. Um, the Iranian currency has plummeted a fair bit, so that means your every dollar now buys tremendous assets. I remember I was one of the judges of the Tehran startup, uh, and, and they, there was like 50 companies, and, and the best than the winning company, the winning prize was $10,000, and they were just so happy for $10,000. That means that you can actually, like, I mean, the startups in the, in the Silicon Valley, you know, they expect 100,000, 200,000, uh, half a million. People are just so hungry, so talented, and I think the opportunities are tremendous to be able to support these people. Um, I think, just, just to finish up, this makes Iran a fantastic, ideal uh, environment for investment. I'm also part of Mohsen, uh, talked about the startup, the Avotech, the Sarava, and also some of our uh, finance and technology that, that is really becoming available in Iran, particularly the new government's working very much about e-government. So the opportunities are fantastic. I'm Farshan the show, and I'm being hassled here, so please keep quiet. Um, uh, I, I, will, I will finish off here. 
If, if you ever want to contact me, I act as a little gateway. All I just want to say, just to finish off here, if my dad and mother was alive today, they'll be so proud of what you guys are doing. Because my dad always said, try to create a wonderful bridge between Iran and the, and, and the West. And thank you for doing that. We have tremendous opportunity. Great. Well done. You know, between, between me and you, there is a rumor that if you walk 20 feet, less than 20 feet from a salmon bank, you will be digitized and get in by Harsha. <laughs> so next time, watch out. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the next speaker, uh, a panelist for, for the panel mentorship uh, is Arman Pahlavan. Uh, it is a very interesting case uh, because I have seen him in that role and I, I had benefited from that personally. It was about 13, 14 years ago. I was 14 years old, of course. And then uh, we, we had some issue in one of the startups we were involved with. We, we, got, we got to talk to him, and, and that, that was probably one of the best examples I saw that how, how the law firms can become a source of mentorship and, and see how that, that can actually become a source of a, a significant correction in, in how to some of the challenges you have to get around. And you know, one of the things which is very interesting about them they may not tell you who they know, but they know everything that happens behind the doors. So it's, it's actually one of the best ways to know what to do and what not to do. And, and I mean, by saying that, I have to add that uh, he has been behind now billions of dollars of transaction for VCs and other startups happening in the Valley. And he has been have a helping hand for the Iranian community making that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. This is why you don't put a lawyer after a businessman. You know, you have some of the beautiful British accent that uh, Farshad has and that exuberance, and then you put a lawyer in the room. So I won't be as, uh, as fun to listen to, but I'll try to make it fun. So one of the things, a couple of observations that I had um, and I'll, before I start this talk um, is, first of all, I just really wanted to thank Amir and Kamran and everybody that's put this together. <laughs> This is such a huge accomplishment, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a huge sucker for supporting these causes just because I just think the people that are behind these events are just magnificent folks with incredible integrity and this uh, amazing, tireless passion for, you know, for doing these things. So I'm just thrilled to be here among you, and whatever I can ever do for you guys, I would be delighted to do with every bit of my passion. Thank you. Um, so um, it's great to see that when I'm, this is the first time I've obviously seen anything about Iran, this land that is so uh, dear to all of us and to me. I've never been back since 77. So it's great to see this. You know, you see the names of the com companies. Is there's, you know, you know, we have Bazaar at, you know, in Iran and we have Fenjon here and we have, you know, Ava there and we have BSIM here. So it's great to see that there really is a synergy even between the names of the companies that are, thank you so much, that are, uh, that are being launched in Iran. So it's just wonderful to see such a close semblance of names as well as in, in hubris. Um, just a couple of things. I love going last actually in this audience. Like you were saying, you know, we have to kind of think about rethinking what you're saying because everybody said so many great things. And I wanted to just uh, touch base on two issues. One is that I think mentorship is a wonderful opportunity for, uh, for everybody, including, frankly, for myself. You know, uh, it's, it's what makes everything happen. We learn every day from different things. And I think as Iranians, we're genetically prone to not listening to anybody. So I think uh, the whole concept of how important mentorship is in the f given with the fact that we absolutely have no interest to listen to anybody else will hopefully will bridge that gap, too. Um, but maybe this, this event will do that. But I think mentorship is key. And I would like to tell you that, you know, a little bit about myself, very few words. I practice in the venture capital and private equity space as a lawyer. I love working in this space. I love launching companies. I love sitting down with Amir and his friends talking about cap tables and how to launch this thing. I love calling Pejban and saying, Pejban, I have a hot company that I would like you to syndicate with another venture fund. I, love to call Kamran and, and ask him questions about various things that are happening. Um, so I'm with the f uh, firm of Perkins Coie. For the second year in a row, we've been named the top venture capital 
firm, uh, law firm in the United States by US World and News Report. So this is what we do as a firm. Um, it's very dear to me. I work in uh, across industries. So I do the information technologies. I do the life sciences. I do the energy technology, especially in the heyday and various other aspects of technology. If you guys are ever stuck somewhere, please come and see me. I'm happy to give you the time. So with that, I'm gonna actually go to a slide to see whether I can even make this thing work. So it says forward, okay. Uh, lawyers as a mentor, you know, the whole concept is contradictory to each other because the, <laughs> the, the issue of lawyers is we, there's a myth about lawyers. You know, we are expensive, you know, um, we, 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 we do things our way, we try to take the benefit for ourselves and put in, your, in our pockets. And it's interesting, Shakespeare and Henry VI, there's a line that I think many of you know. It says, first thing we do is kill all the lawyers. Now, th that was not meant to kind of, you know, decrease your f the fees that you ha have to pay for closing a transaction, but rather it was <laughs> contemplated to eliminate those who might stand in the way of a contemplated revolution. But revolution is a great thing. Well, we are all stricken with revolution, so we're plenty friendly to revolutions. We've you know, experienced all that. And we're all creating disruptive technologies, whether it's in Iran or here in the United States. So you know, the revolution is not something that we don't want to incite. So if, might as well get a lawyer to see where it goes and how they can help you. Um, so again, the myth of a lawyer. You know, what do we do? We do things for our own benefit. We change, we, we charge too much. We stand in the way of deals fast, closing fast. So that's the, that's the myth of a lawyer. But the truth is that in Silicon Valley, and I think, uh, I forget, Saeed or Pejman were saying something about, you know, that the, being in Silicon Valley is, is, is a mindset, is a way of being, it's a way of living. And as Amir was saying, we really are behind a lot of deals. We see a lot of things that a lot of you guys don't see. At any given point in time, we, you know, we're in boardrooms of 13 to 15 to 20 companies, and we, you know, we really see the human interaction at these board meetings. And, and much, of, much of what we do in the mentorship and our role really is really one thing, is to how to align, um, how to align the perspective of the founders who launch companies with what's happening inside the companies as inside the boardrooms. And it's a very complex set of circumstances because the, there's a divergence of those interests as companies continue to grow you will see the founder group not having the same incentives as the people that are coming in as investors. You get different rounds of financing that are that where the early stage investors are tapped out and they don't have the cash to put in and the later stage investors that are bigger investors come in and put in the money and they want to crunch the smaller investors and keep the company going and put funding in the company so that they can get larger shares. Now what does all that, how does that all translate to, to what we really are trying to do with Iran, right? And I would like to posit that, um, you know, again, it was one really funny about um, one of the things that you were saying, um, Fashid, about the integrated coin system. Well, I guess Bitcoin was really created in Iran, right? Um, so, um, you know, we have case studies of, I wanted to put up three or four of them. You know, our role is really how to help you guys get launched, right? So a few of the deals that we just recently have helped, you know, companies in terms of their, their endeavors is, you know, there was a Bitcoin company that was being launched. Um, there was, they had some blockchain technology, very sophisticated stuff using Ripple, all the things that I wouldn't really understand. And, um, and it was, they were trying to apply this to the broker-dealer system. And I got a call from one, the family office of one of the very, very large family offices in Silicon Valley as a referral saying that this was going to get launched. And they wanted to work with the founder. And there was a complete divergence of interest about you know, what they wanted to do in terms of equity ownership for the founder versus the family office that was launching this thing. So you know, our role really in that case was really how to get the founder in line with the, with the family office to try to explain to them under what circumstances that should be done, what are the equity this, you know, splits, et cetera, et cetera. Another one that I wanted to, to just a couple of them, uh, a recycling company came to me after one of these events, actually a few years back, in the heyday of the, of the energy technology companies. And the, one of the members of the audience called me and said, I have a term sheet from Venrock, but the term sheet is not really that favorable. So we want to figure out how to do this on a more favorable terms. 
you know, I made a couple of calls and we got a much better term sheet for him. And then the CEO of the company was being replaced and we, I called a couple of friends and I brought a friendly CEO to the deal. Another one of our e-health company just got funded and I took them to Tom Fogarty and Tom Fogarty wrote a check for $250,000 walking out the door to get the company funded. So um, I know that Amir wants me to stop talking, but I have to just speak about two things that I would promise to go. Um, one of the, I wanted to give you some observations from, the, um, uh, from, the, from what we were talking about today and the things that I've heard. Um, Silicon Valley is a culture, it's, it, is, it is not an institution, it's a way of life. I completely agree with this. It's a way of doing things. And Iranian culture is very much adaptable to the Silicon Valley way. We are, you know, we have very old history. We have been in merchant classes. We, we are entrepreneurial in our spirit. At least in one industry, the wine industry, we've traded the wine for 2,500 years, say for the last couple of years. And we have a really strong character and entrepreneurial nature in, 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 our, in, our, in our blood. We have lots of support here. So all these things that we're doing with Iran, with what Saeed was saying, helping some of the com you know, companies coming over here, this is a huge support here. And in terms of Sequoia Capital, you know, I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Mike Moritz. Mike Moritz said to me that if three white guys walk into my room, I will simply not fund them because he's, he believes in the self-selection process. And he went and explained to me what the self-selection process meant. And he said, what I mean by the self-selection process is that you guys have self-selected yourself from a different country to come here. If you didn't do it, your parents did it. Then you self-selected yourself to come over and get studied in a specific university. You self-selected to come to Silicon Valley. Then somehow you've select, self-selected yourself to come into my office. And I have much more faith in that self-selection process than funding some, you know, a group of three people who have not gone through that self-selection process. That's and the last slide I wanted to talk about. So Sequoia is a very key example of how this really happens. And the last observation I want to just give you is that the Silicon Valley structure, and I think Dr. M Mr. Nazari, Nazari was, was talking about the stock options and various other things. These are based on legal structures that have been vetted for the last 30 years. This whole concept of preferred stock financing, the concept of stock options, how to incentivize people and management is very key in terms of the culture. And we have to figure out how to do that within the Iranian legal system, and it's important. And the Iranian legal, legal system, frankly, can use some mentorship. I was lucky enough to actually be one of the people that helped draft the private equity uh, treaty between Singapore and Iran on the back end of it. And so there's these things that are happening, and they're key. But I would love to see, you know, companies like Dr. Nazari's company and other companies that are really have gone public to really use the Chinese structure, flipping some of these companies into Cayman structure and try to lead the, pay, the way and pave the way for kind of doing kind of more sophisticated financing for Iranian companies. I thank you again. Thank you, Amir. Sorry for the long chat. Thank you, Amarjan. So, uh, the next uh, panelist is actually, uh, you're very familiar with him, it's Tony Perkins, already uh, have run the last panel for us. And uh, there is a very uh, a special role that he's playing in, in Silicon Valley, and actually we thought that can be helpful on the uh, mentorship side. Uh, there has been many questions and discussion has come in, in, uh, during the day that, okay, we have an event, that's great, we all like it, then what's next? Is it going to die down or wait till next year or there is something we can do about it? And what we have heard from every of, uh, every of you or, or the uh, panelists and the speakers is that uh, we, you know, other than the investments and technology and all those that, that, that has to be there, the mentorship part is kind of critical. We have a, uh, a significant potential in, in uh, the, um, uh, the community, Iranian community in US especially that they have done this a lot. They like to have the edu education of the entrepreneurship to kind of uh, past the borders, and the question is how to do that. I want to ask Tony Perkins as an uh, example platforms that can enable this through always on their, uh, their system to, to give us some. Uh, thank you. All righty, good to be back up here. Uh, you've heard enough of me, so I'm going to be, be very brief. Um, you know, earlier it was uh, referenced uh, Steve Jobs' uh, commencement speech at Stanford, and, and part of that speech is he talked about 
uh, that you know, he looked back in his life and he talked about you know, different events that happened in his life uh, that led to where he uh, got. And he, uh, he used as an example that uh, while he had dropped out of college, he was sneaking into classes at Reed College and he snuck into a class on calligraphy uh, and he really fell in love with fonts and all those things. And uh, if you remember, when the, what made the Macintosh computer was desktop publishing. And it was really his passion that he learned while going to college that ended up being the dot that connected uh, to his first greatest uh, invention, which was the Macintosh computer. So uh, when I look back on my life, uh, my first great a break. I referenced that I had been at the very beginning of Silicon Valley Bank, uh, but uh, at that startup bank, I had a great president, Roger Smith, who introduced me literally uh, to people like Cameron and all the great entrepreneurs and investors uh, at, in Silicon Valley at the time uh, in the 80s. And, you know, that experience, building that network uh, or having that network, I built on that network uh, and, and created my career. So I think as a mentor, one of the greatest things that you can do is help young people create a network. Uh, if you think about it, people go to Stanford Business School. The greatest value to going to Stanford Business School is really uh, meeting a lot of people and meeting a lot of great uh, people who come uh, to speak at Stanford. Uh, my very best friend since I was six years old is a great uh, person, Tim Draper, one of the great entrepreneurs. Uh, he started uh, Draper University. So if you know any uh, uh, young people in Iran that want to come and quickly uh, learn about Silicon Valley, I highly suggest you look at Tim's uh, program. Uh, finally, as uh, Amir was uh, noting, uh, at Always On, we've created an online network to network the global Silicon Valley. And as part of that, uh, when you sign up, you can note that you want to be a mentor so that young people uh, can search and find you and connect with you. So again, uh, in summary, uh, it's always interesting to look, you know, that your life is really about a bunch of what appear to be spontaneous events that happen in your life, uh, but when you are, you know, get older, you can look back and see how all those dots uh, connect and how you really get where you are today. And so it's, I guess I shouldn't be surprised uh, that I'm building uh, at Always On a social network and giving back uh, a gift that I was given at a very young age. Uh, so with that, I'll sit down. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And uh, I want to mention that uh, we are going to have a follow-up discussion kind of take it to the next level on the mentorship, as you heard, in Yaron on Tuesday night, in case you're interested. There's some uh, uh, paper outside, you can, you can sign your name, and hopefully at that meeting we're going to have more discussion and some practical uh, moves on that. So the next uh, panelist is uh, Amin Saveri. Uh, he's an Associate Professor of Management Science and Engineering uh, and TRECOM faculty scholar at Stanford University. He got his BS back from Sharif University and PhD from Georgia Tech. Uh, he has, has a long list of awards that he has won because of the work he's doing, and uh, he can shed some light about the, in, the interaction between the universities and, and entrepreneurs in uh, US. Can you please? Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, especially among this uh, group of esteemed uh, entrepreneurs and uh, uh, visionaries and uh, movers and shakers in Silicon Valley. Uh, I should confess I feel like an outsider because um, I'm just a computer scientist. Uh, I entered this world uh, around two years ago. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, all right. Um, one of my colleagues um, approached me who wanted to teach his uh, technology entrepreneurship course um, uh, that's been taught uh, in a Stanford for a few years now online. Um, he had recorded a few videos and you know, didn't know, you know sort of what to do next. Um, and uh, what he wanted to do, his goal was to uh, scale up 
the experience of the student um, who, who take his course in Stanford, but you know, online and open it to the world. Um, so we decided to uh, help him. You know, my research is in the area of uh, uh, understanding online social networks. Uh, so we actually committed maybe um, four weeks to him, four weekends to him, uh, to build a system. Um, what we didn't know uh, was that um, for his online class, uh, 80,000 people signed up uh, from all around the world. And these guys were you know, from Silicon Valley's, uh, you know, sort of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, uh, all the way to these you know, kids in Accra, Ghana, uh, who didn't have internet access at home or at school. They had to go to an internet cafe to submit their homeworks. We helped them form teams. Uh, we helped them you know, um, you know, sort of identify a business model, work on it. Um, uh, they you know, sort of started on various business models from mobile technology to social networks to healthcare, you name it. And um, uh, close to the end, you know, sort of, uh, we helped them uh, find mentors and uh, the best teams pitched to um, venture capitalists. Uh, the course led to creation of companies, and not just in the US, uh, but um, in, you know, uh, uh, in Asia, in Latin America, in Europe. Uh, you know, fast forward, uh, it actually you know, sort of led to creation of company uh, Novo Ed. Uh, over the past two years, uh, we have partnered with 20 universities. Uh, Stanford is still our biggest partner, but UC Berkeley, Haas School of Business is another partner. Princeton University, University of Michigan. We offer courses, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, a lot of the courses are actually uh, uh, free and open to the world. Uh, I have actually come here uh, with two gifts for you. These are two courses that are recorded by my uh, colleagues in Stanford. Uh, the technology entrepreneurship is great if you want to start uh, as an entrepreneur, you can sign up. If you'd like to join as a mentor, uh, we have a global network of mentors who are you know, helping uh, 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 entrepreneurs. Um, I have you know, sort of a few people here, including uh, uh, my friend uh, Pejman Nozad, who is a mentor here. Um, if you're having a you know, sort of, you want to scale up your uh, venture, your uh, startup, um, Huggy Rao and Bob Sutton, two of my colleagues, have done, you know, so they have, uh, you know, sort of extracted years of research into a short course about best practices for scaling. Um, so these courses are starting soon, and I invite you to um, uh, take the courses. Um, it's um, not just a you know, sort of collection of lectures. You will be joining a community. Uh, there are you know, sort of we have uh, uh, helped the, with the creation of, you know, uh, tens of courses. Uh, it's a community of around 600,000 students, uh, hundreds of thousands of teams, uh, project essays, uh, videos, and various business models. It has, you know, sort of uh, led to creation of a, a global community of entrepreneurs, including from um, uh, a lot of teams from Iran. Uh, the top teams uh, at the end which, you know, pitch to venture capitalists for uh, funding, and we haven't had teams from Iran that are finalists. My hope is that in the next round, uh, we will get um, folks from uh, uh, Iran. So, you know, uh, I started by saying, um, um, you know, sort of novo ed, you know, sort of creation as a startup, um, but, you know, it, you know it's, it, for us, it's more than that. It's um, a cause, and uh, it's uh, you know sort of has a group of faculty in uh, you know universities all around the U.S. and all around the world, uh, a small team of uh, uh, programmers uh, in um, uh, in uh, San Francisco, actually led by my co-founder um, uh, Farnaz Ronari, who is a, a Sharif grad and. Uh, you know, she not only you know sort of uh, architected the, the main platform. Uh, she's now leading a team of uh, engineers uh, that are uh, uh, helping this you know sort of hundreds of thousands of students around the world. Um, I'm here to extend my hand and uh, ask for your help. Uh, I know there is a lot of technical talent, for example, here. Uh, join us. Help us uh, make the world a better place uh, using the power of uh, education. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the next panel, uh, member on the panel uh, is Carol Sand. Uh, she is the founder and managing member of the Angel Ferroman Halo Funds. 
that's a nice title to say, but let's get to the bottom of that. Uh, I want to I want to share with you an experience we had inviting her to to a program in uh, Yaron, and she is one of those that, as I said, is going to change a little bit the official tone here, get to the bottom of it, and tell us all about it. What's the mentorship about? What to do and not to do? So buckle up, she's coming. So I'm thrilled to be here today, but the truth of the matter is I have a very strong bias, and that is that entrepreneurship is essential for changing the world, but without angel investors, without people who are willing to put their own personal money to help them get that idea from the concept stage and move it into reality, nothing happens. And so what the um, community really needs is a stronger set of committed angel investors. I happen to teach a class at Stanford Continuing Education. Um, I'm doing that because I'm trying to teach people how to be a good, productive, and successful angel investor. And, um, basically passing on the knowledge that my partners and I have collected over the last 20 years and being able to share them with you so that you can increase the probability of being a financially viable angel investor. This happens regardless of where you choose to invest. Investing in very early stage startups is not a geo um, defined process. It is the same in Silicon Valley as it is in Hong Kong as it could be in Tehran. And I'm here to encourage you to um, consider doing this. It typically takes about two years of active investing to figure out whether or not you're any good at it. So um, it's a wonderful experiment. If you turn out to be good at it, you can make a gigantic difference in the world. If you find that this is not for you, then there are other ways for you to be able to help the entrepreneurial community, and I'm happy to talk to you about that also. But at the end of the day, money really is the um, energy that ignites the whole process, and your money is the most important that they will ever get, so thank you. Okay, so the, the, we are last but not least, we are with the last panelist here, uh, is Freydun Taslimi. Uh, he is a serial entrepreneur, many successes in the past. Right now, is the CTO of a company called Performance ICT. And uh, he is one of the uh, proud examples of people or entrepreneurs that actually have a large impact on the social side, also on the community. SAF, which was one of the, one of the uh, very important initiative happened in Iran for internet uh, connectivity, is one of the ones that Freydun had a big impact on. I ask him to come. My apologies for not having any uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. I just found out that uh, I was on the panel by seeing my name there. <laughs> in uh, 2000, I was contacted by uh, Dr. Abbas Edalat, and he asked me if I want to get involved in something, in a, in a, a project that he started in England. That was uh, putting computers in schools in Iran. And to me, that was fascinating because my wife and I we were looking into trying to do something, something interesting in Iran. And uh, so we created the Science and, Art, uh, Science and Art Foundation in the United States. And we went around, did a lot of fundraising. And uh, we came here, and Kamran was gracious enough to uh, do a fantastic fundraising for us. So we said, we're all set, and now we're going to do what we wanted to do. So we went to OFAC. And guess what? OFAC basically said, no, we can't do anything. So as in Iran, we say, uh, uh, with, with Hosesh, 
Anyway, I, I don't remember the phrase, but anyway. So we decided to uh, engage in uh, projects which are outside Iran that uh, Iranians in, in Iran can uh, uh, participate in. And we looked around, we found two projects. One of them was Robocop uh, contest. Those who are familiar with Robocop, they know that this is a contest in year 2015, 2050. The idea is the robots play with uh, uh, human beings and win. So we decided that was one, and the other one was IRON. It's an educational uh, uh, charitable organization. The first Robocop we went to, which actually was with Paymon, this was in uh, Seattle. And there were about 10 Iranians participated. What was interesting to me was the fact that uh, when the Iranians were playing with the Italians, every time Iranian scored a goal, the Italians started uh, uh, clapping for the Iranians. So I went to the guy and said, you know, what is the story? Why do you clap for them? He said, the Iranians don't have the proper equipment, they don't have the right camera. So what they've done through sheer technology and ingenuity, they have to, uh, that way they actually, that's how they're scoring uh, goals. And to me that was fascinating and it kind of showed uh, the kind of a, a pent up uh, potential which is in Iran. So we decided to support uh, the Robocop contest. The, first, the second robot con contest we participated in, uh, we went, I went to Japan, and many of these students actually would come in there not knowing that they have a hotel room. And there was one group I remember, they came with a suitcase full of uh, tuna because they weren't sure whether they would have money for food or not. So we w would actually uh, pay for the hotel room and try to help them this way. And we had checked and this was an okay uh, process. In Japan, uh, 60 uh, people participated. In Padua, in Italy, uh, there were about uh, 90 people. And the last Robocop I was involved with, uh, it was in uh, uh, actually Atlanta. And I thought initially there was going to be about 40 Iranians. And when I invited them to my house, about 120 Iranians showed up. So we had this car running to the nearest cello kebab place, the nearest Iranian restaurant, getting food. The point of it is, uh, this kind of mentorship by, through support is very easy to do. This morning, uh, Dave challenged everybody to uh, do an investment in Iran. That's maybe a little difficult. But the mentorship I'm talking about is very simple. Find somebody in Iran and support him to enter into a contest in the United States. And I'm hoping by next year, if, uh, if you have this conference, when we ask people how many people you have actually supported, there will be a whole bunch of uh, hands raised. Thank you. Okay, so first I want to make just a correction. A couple of times, few times earlier has been mentioned, a couple of names as people that make the event happen. I want to make sure you understand the gravity of what has happened here, about 50 people, and I'm, I mean it when I say 50 people, of organizers, uh, volunteers, have been working on this for a few months for this to happen. I want to make a correction, and, and later today we'll have a bigger correction about this to just make sure that they're all acknowledged for what they're doing. Many of them actually, they cannot even see the program because they're all back working to make this happen. So we, we'll have a short QA to just make sure that, that we don't go over time. Uh, I'll go based on, based on the questions that actually have come uh, on the wall, if you see it, is based on the votes that has been given. This again comes both from inside the room and also uh, overseas if anybody is, is awake still. Uh, the first question, uh, and the nice thing about it is it just comes. So be ready, whatever it comes, whatever it comes. It's okay. So it says, can panelists comment on entrepreneurship in the humanities and social sciences? It cannot be healthy for Iran to, for university graduates to be predominantly engineers. Anybody want us to take take a shot at this? The the question really I think is is that is there is there is a significant focus on engineering and people are questioning that is that healthy? Is this is this happening also in U.S. Everybody is only doing engineering. Every value is around engineering. What about humanities and other? other, uh, uh, you know, directions. So, you know, the, 
Is this on? Yeah. So I think that um, the best entrepreneurial teams are where you have a diversity of personalities and skill sets. And though um, most investors like investing in technology, not all startups um, involve technology. And at the end of the day, as an early stage investor, I'm focused on one question. If I put money in, how much money will I get back? And if that um, can be a large multiple, and it's not involving technology, I'm happy and I'm willing to invest. So the um, truth of the matter is most engineers need at least one or two people in the startup to translate the technology into human understandable language and usability. And so having the diversity of, um, of the team is very important. Thank you. Any other take? I, I, would, I would like to just add to that, add to what Carol is saying. I think actually the best CEOs are the CEOs who are well-rounded, right? So especially with these, uh, all these consumer-facing applications that are in the, in the world of technology, you really do need to have some awareness of social behaviors, how things will act towards the consumers, how the consumers will deal with things. You know, if you look at all these, you know, Facebook issues and privacy issues. I mean, these are things that are much more complicated than just engineering. So I think, I think there's going to be a, you know, th there, I think technology ties down to many other faculties. Um, and I think what's happening though is that those faculties are becoming more statistic savvy. Um, and this is just as an experience. Yesterday, I was interviewing somebody from Stanford Law School for our summer class, for summer associate position. And the guy was telling me that they are bringing statistics into the teaching curriculum in the law school so that it will start you know, managing the issues of behavior and statistics and law. And this is becoming a real big focus of Stanford Law School about how this needs to be done and people are starting to learn how to code inside the law school. So, um, yeah, I, and, I, and then frankly, I was a humanities student. I, I can't stand reading on Nook or any of these, you know, <laughs> devices. So I, I, I am a little bit hard pressed to say yes. You know, uh, so, you know, you know, technology is fine, and but I think that the reality is that the world is changing, and we just have to adapt to it. Thank you. Okay, so let me let me move to another question. Uh, the question has come here is that how can we do mentorship of entrepreneurship at large scales, not just a few hundreds here and there in the hope of a few dozen ventures and one or two successes? Any takes? Well, I just have a suggestion really. I think uh, if you want to start with a large scale mentorship, you've got to start with a small scale mentorship. He's taking the time, taking the effort to get to know uh, the individual and, and really maybe getting to know Iran. Uh, I know from my, uh, sometimes bitter, before I went to Iran, I didn't have a single gray hair. And for 10 years, I've been going in and out of Iran. And actually, you know, make, paid a big price, but it's been so rewarding, really getting involved and actually supporting and, and, and nurturing the development. And that, that's the, and this, this really turned to be very, very profitable for me. Very good, thank you. So how about I end, since the time is on pressure right now, by, by one, asking one question, now I'll like ask it another way, actually. I, I heard it from Carol earlier in one of the emails. He was saying, how can you find out if a mentor is not good and how do you fire him or her? The, the question was, if they're not a how good do you know? How do you know that the mentor is not good for you? How do you, know how do you, how do you find that out? Have you had any experience shared when, when a mentorship didn't work? Interesting. It's a good question. Um, you know, I, uh, I'll, I'll copy some words from, from a mentor of mine uh, and somebody, somebody I look up to in Boulder, um, Brad Feld, uh, who, who said that when you choose your mentors, you should have some rules, some design constraints. And the rule that uh, he lives by, are, there's two of them. One is, and part of my French, he has a rule, it's no assholes rule. And uh, part of that rule is as soon as you feel that tension or if you don't feel like the heart's in the right spot, then I would say that's probably not 
you're right, mentor. The second one that he has is, does the person pass the beer test? And what he's really saying is, is this somebody you want to sit down with? Would you enjoy their company? And would you like to share a drink, whether it's tea or beer or whatever it is, um, and dive in as a friend? Um, and so if, uh, if I feel that tension, then, then I wouldn't ask that person to be a mentor. Great. Any other? Please. I actually have something. I, I haven't heard this word actually today very much. It's a question of failing fast, right? This is, we're talking about successing all, you know, successful this, successful that, how to succeed. I think both in terms of mentoring, you know, finding the right mentor, you know, you need to, you need to fail fast in it, right? If you pick somebody and things just don't work out, get out of it, you know? There's plenty of other people that are gonna be there. And the sooner you come to, to the resolution that this is not working, the much further ahead you will be and, and the mentor will be as well. Anybody else? Very good. So I would like to thank all the panelists. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Can all of you give yourselves a big round of applause for being this energetic still at this time of the day? <laughs>